É, obrigada, gente, pela presença. É, mais uma vez, uma edição, agora uma edição extra do fórum. Queria agradecer ao professor Marcelo Duarte, a pesquisadora, e quem vai apresentar a pesquisadora, a pesquisadora é o professor. Bem, boa tarde a todos. É, primeiramente, gostaria de agradecer a, a, a participação da Mariana Elias no simpósio do Fórum Sistemática e Evolução, a presença de todos e o museu que disponibilizou então o espaço para a gente ter é, a palestra da Mariane Elias hoje. A Mariane, a doutora Mariane Elias, ela é pesquisadora do CNRS, que é um centro nacional de pesquisa que está associado a várias instituições na França. No caso da doutora Mariane, ela está associada ao Museu de História Natural de Paris. E ela tem doutorado em Biologia Evolutiva, se formou pela Universidade de Montpellier, na França, e o seu último pós-doutorado foi no Imperial College de Londres. Eu tenho que colar porque são muitas informações. Eu passei para vocês o currículo dela, então é só para a gente apontar algumas das atividades da, da Mariane. Suas linhas de pesquisa principais são padrões de diversidade, com borboletas miméticas da região neotropical, estudos filogenéticos na análise de comunidades ecológicas e especiação ecológica. Ela tem publicado vários trabalhos de bastante impacto e hoje ela vai falar sobre que fatores estruturam a biodiversidade no ecossistema mais rico do planeta, tendo as borboletas miméticas da subfamília Itomine, da família Ninfade, como o um modelo de seus estudos. Mais uma vez agradeço a todos e, doutora Mariane, por favor. Muito obrigada, Marcelo. Muito obrigada a vocês por, por vir. Então, eu estou pensando dar a palestra em inglês, mas se tiver alguma pessoa que não entende bem inglês, também eu posso dar em português. Só, só que meu português científico está muito errado, eu não estou acostumada a falar ciência em português. Então, não sei, vocês que sabem. O inglês está inglês bom para todos? Está bom, está melhor assim. Um... Então, bom, todo mundo sabe o que é a biodiversidade. E quando... É... Bom, eu estou começando em português. <risos> bom, vou falar em inglês. Então, sim. Todo mundo sabe o que é a biodiversidade. E foi o foco de interesse para uh, muitos biólogos. E quando você quer estudar a biodiversidade, há algumas coisas que você precisa olhar. Uh, primeiro, você precisa olhar a especiação e a diversificação. Então, como as espécies... Um, originate and then how they diversify in more species, but also you need to look at um, species coexistence um, at the community scale, so where uh, species interact and live. Um, so uh, there are se several processes that can uh, determine species coexistence patterns, including uh, local adaptation, which is also referred to as uh, habitat filtering. So only species with certain adaptation uh, can live in certain habitats. Um, but you also need to look at interactions among species. And of course, uh, there are trophic interactions, um, mutualism between trophic levels, for instance, uh, pollinators and plants. But um, there are also interactions uh, within trophic level, such as competition. So species might compete for resources, for food. Um, but it's perhaps less known, um, but there are also um, mutualistic or positive interactions um, within trophic level, so among uh, potential competitors. For instance, um, there is something called facilitation in plants, and some plants, species, benefit from the presence of other species uh, to grow. And so these uh, positive interactions uh, are very well documented, but perhaps less well studied than competition. And um, to study uh, all of this, because there's a lot of evolution in all of these processes, Then uh, recently, there has been an incentive to incorporate uh, the evolutionary history of species using phylogenies. So um, I don't know if you all know what phylogenies are, but briefly, a phylogeny uh, represents the pattern of relatedness uh, between species. So usually, uh, it has the, the shape of a tree. 
Um, it could be based on mo molecular, morphological, or even behavioral data. Um, there are several methods to construct a tree like this, uh, maximum parsimony, maximum likelihood, or uh, Bayesian inference. And uh, we, we can also um, impose uh, a clock on this tree such that um, branch length represents time. And there are several advanced methods um, to take into account differences in evolution uh, among species and uh, lineages. So these are phylogenies. And then what are phylogenies uh, used for? So um, they can be used in many, many different ways. Um, the first one is uh, systematics. So this is an example of the phylogeny, molecular phylogeny of, of the birds. And it's very useful because sometimes uh, it can recover relationships between um, groups that were not suspected before. Uh, such as here, uh, they found that the, the parrots were sister to passeriforms, and it was kind of a, a surprise. Um, then phylogenies can be used uh, for biogeography to understand um, the, the geographical patterns of diversification of a group. So this is a work uh, done by uh, Niklas Wahlberg and Andre Freitas from Campinas, and they, they reconstructed the, um, uh, the geographical distribution uh, of the subtribe uh, Physiodina, wh which are butterflies. So you can reconstruct uh, ancestral um, areas of distribution. But uh, you can also use phylogenies to understand uh, temporal patterns of diversifications. So to do that, it's very important to have uh, the branch length representing time, and so you need fossils or some kind of calibration. Um, and then um, you can convert, so I mean, when you look at something like that, you have uh, the impression that there is more speciation uh, here at the beginning, and at the end, uh, there is much less uh, diversification, except perhaps here. You can represent a phylogeny um, into another form. So here you have the time, and here you have the number of lineages. So uh, here you, on, you, you have two lineages, and here you have three, etc. So you have more and more lineages. Uh, and this is, is in logarithmic scale. So this as a function of time, and depending on, on the shape you have, um, you can infer uh, the, the extinction rate, the speciation rate, and the, the shape um, of this diversification pattern. So in this study, um, in the genus Dendroica, just uh, having a phylogeny, uh, time-calibrated phylogeny, they found out um, that um, the speciation rate uh, decreased uh, with time, uh, extinction rate was very small, and this is consistent um, with uh, re adaptive radiation. When you have adaptive radiation at the beginning, you've got a lot of empty niches to be filled, so um, a lot of species can, can be formed, um, a lot of speciation occurs, and then uh, as the number of species grows, then niches are filled already, so there, there is less and less opportunities for more speciation, and this is what they found. So just with a phylogeny, without any data on character or distribution, you can already say a lot of things. Um, you can also uh, study character evolution and do some comparative analysis. So in this example, um, they, they reconstructed the, the length uh, of uh, the nectar spur um, of different uh, columbine flowers. And uh, they found that um, as evolution went on, the, the size of the nectar spur increased and that they, there has been uh, seven independent shifts from uh, a smaller uh, length to a, a bigger length. And they found it's associated with the, uh, what pollinates uh, this plant. So again, this is another use of phylogenies. And finally, uh, a use which is less known, and I'm going to give more detail on this, uh, is using phylogenies uh, in community ecology. So basically, um, yeah, you've, you've got different communities, and uh, to, to understand how species uh, are assembled, uh, why this species coexists, then you, you, you generate the phylogeny of, of all the species in your communities. So more specifically, um, you, you can use this in two ways. Um, you can use phylogenies uh, to disentangle um, what is due to common ancestry uh, uh, from adaptation. So for instance, two species uh, that interact in your community can share um, the same character either because they've they have inherited this character from their ancestor, their common ancestor, or because they, they have responded uh, in the same way to the same selective pressure. 
And so you need the phylogeny to be able to distinguish between the two. And the other thing you could do with uh, phylogenies of communities uh, is to infer the processes that shape um, the structure of the communities. So distinguish between habitat filtering, um, competition, and then uh, just neutral processes um, if none of them shape the, the, the communities. So yeah, more details on this. Uh, this is uh, something, um, an idea of uh, Cam Webb. And so um, this assumes that uh, related species tend to share more traits, which is often true. And Webb says that uh, if habitat filtering, local adaptation, uh, shapes the structure of the community, then species that coexist in communities uh, sh tend to share a lot of traits uh, that are related to adaptation uh, to uh, this particular habitat. And uh, because uh, species that share more traits are more related than species within communities are more related than species in different communities. So you should have a phylogenetic pattern like this. If these are communities and this is of the phylogeny, you should, ha you should have this, which is called uh, phylogenetic clustering. Um, on the contrary, uh, if you don't have much habitat filtering, but if competition is very strong among your species, then uh, species that, that can coexist are species that feed on different resources that use different microhabitats, for instance. So species that, uh, on average, don't share many traits. So species that, on average, are less related uh, within communities than among communities. And you should have um, these kind of patterns, phylogenetic overdispersion. And finally, uh, you can have, have also, which is most common, uh, a random distribution of species according to the phylogeny. So depending on what pattern you find, then you can infer uh, the process that shaped the community. Oops, sorry. But um, so all this framework uh, has somehow ignored uh, the positive interactions that I was talking about at the beginning. So for this reason, uh, we decided, because we were interested in, in biodiversity and factors that shape biodiversity and diversification groups, but um, we were working on a group uh, that has uh, positive interactions among potential competitors. So the group uh, we're uh, working on are Ithomian butterflies. They are neotropical butterflies. Um, it's a very big uh, tribe with uh, over 370 species with a wide distribution um, ranging from zero to th more than uh, 3,000 meters, so uh, diversity of elevation and yeah, habitats. And um, the interesting thing is that um, species in this group um, interact positively through Mullerian mimicry. So what is Mullerian mimicry in butterfly? Oops, sorry. So basically, uh, some species are toxic uh, to the predators, and they, they advertise their toxicity using a conspicuous color pattern, like bright patterns, colors, and they, they fly slowly and showing, displaying their patterns. Uh, the predators, such as birds, have to learn, so they have first to try them, and then they discover that they're not good to eat, and then they remember, and they don't attack them anymore. So for instance, this bird has already tried uh, species A, and knows uh, that it, it is toxic. Species B, C, and D are all, are all toxic, and, but only B and C look like A. So when uh, this bird uh, encounters B or C, uh, it assimilates them with A, and it's not going to, att to attack them. But uh, it hasn't tried any blue species, so if it sees D, uh, then it will attack, attack D and, and kill it. So um, it's very advantageous to, to have um, to share the same signal, the same color patterns. So uh, in practice, um, you have a lot of different species uh, that are not sometimes very distantly related, but that, that, share, uh, that share the same um, color pattern. So here is an, is an example of four mimicry complexes uh, with different species. And in each complex, uh, you can have uh, up to 15 species. Yeah. There are even more than, than mimic uh, some of these patterns. And, uh, these are positive interactions because uh, any species benefits from the presence of a species which has the same patterns because it increases the density um, of individuals with the same patterns so uh, birds will learn faster. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about two things. First, um, 
the diversification of uh, ethomia and butterflies. And for this, I will use uh, comprehensive uh, species level phylogeny, so phylogeny with all species, uh, distribution data, and some uh, trait character data. And then in the second part, I'm going to, to speak about species coexistence, um, so community structure, using um, this time uh, a community level phylogeny. So for this, I don't need to have uh, a full phylogeny of all species of ethomians, but only of the species that live in the community and um, abundance data. So the, the first part. So um, first, um, to understand, so I mean, ethomians are uh, neotropical, and to understand their diversification, it's very important to know something about uh, the geology of the region. So uh, it's a big group, a large group, and there are several hypotheses uh, to explain this diversity. Uh, some one class of hypotheses uh, relies on uh, vicariance. With vicariance means uh, allopatric speciation. When, when, when you have um, a geographical barrier uh, that splits a population in two, then these two populations will eventually uh, form species. So what could cause vicariance here? Well, uh, the uplift of the Andes uh, could obviously separate uh, Western and, and Eastern lineages. And uh, the Andes, um, so I mean, they've been rising for a very long time, but um, in, during the Miocene, um, the central Andes have accelerated uh, rising. And then um, in the Pliocene, the, the Colombian northern Andes also started rising. Uh, then um, there has been some marine incursions uh, during the, the Miocene, so uh, something called uh, Lac Pibas here, uh, which has also isolated this part and this part. Um, apart from this, um, I mean, th this Lake Pibas then has turned into, uh, into the Amazon, and now the Amazon is flowing this way, so um, big rivers could also constitute a barrier. Uh, then uh, in the Pliocene, there has been the closure of the Panama Isthmus, so um, this has connected um, the, the two subcontinents, so it might also have affected the distribution and evolution of, of these butterflies. And finally, during uh, the Pleistocene, uh, there has been a lot of climatic oscillations with perhaps a retraction of the forest, so creating small refugia, and uh, it has been hypothesized that um, some species have originated during this period. So these are all hypotheses based on, on vicariance, uh, geographic separation. Uh, but uh, there could also be um, speciation uh, owing to ecological factors and for instance when you have uh, the uplift of the Andes uh, you have uh, a long uh, environmental gradient so different temperatures, different host plants etc. So uh, this could also create um, speciation and also uh, you could have uh, adaptive radiation so these are mimetic butterflies with different patterns you could have perhaps a, a variation um, a radiation on different color patterns or on host plants these butterflies um, feed on, on Solanacea, the, the tomato family. So these are hypotheses we're trying to investigate. So I'll show you an example using uh, two genera. This is a work we did in collaboration with um, Andre Freitas from Campinas. And we generated um, the phylogenies of these two genera, molecular phylogenies, uh, time calibrated. And uh, so we, we got uh, distribution um, and elevation data, so uh, lowland, middle elevation, and high elevation species represented here. So I'll, I'll go quite quickly um, on the results, but um, I mean the, the conclusions are quite clear. So I mean, don't, don't really look at that. This is the distribution in the different uh, regions, but it's not very important. But um, anyway, we, we are trying to, to reconstruct by lax maximum likelihood the origin um, of of each, um, each uh, clade. And we found that um, the, in both cases, the ancestor was um, in altitude, um, and that uh, it was also in the central Andes, so uh, in, in this region here. And then, um, so then both clades have diversified uh, going down. Uh, we found some evidence for uh, vicariance caused by, by the Andes. Some, some lineages are separated by, by the Andes, uh, but uh, there weren't many cases like that. And we found, so I'm not going to detail the method, but basically we found that um, the shifts in elevation range, so uh, when you, you shift from lowland, for instance, to mid-elevation, uh, these shifts are associated with speciation events. 
basically we, we tested several models of evolution uh, of elevation and uh, we, we moved the, the length of the branch and uh, I mean I can explain this method later for those who are interested but uh, yeah what we found is that there was support for the model uh, where uh, shifts in elevation range was associated with speciation Um, but in, in spite of that, uh, there is also a lot of uh, diversification within elevation level. For instance, all these clades here, they all have the same elevation range. Uh, they are lowland and they have diversified a lot. Same thing here and in this, this clade too. Um, so uh, several factors can explain the diversification of this group. Now, um, we can also look at the time course uh, of speciation. So during these, these graphs I was talking about at the beginning. And um, I mean, th there are a lot of different statistics, but the, the main thing that uh, we found that uh, the, the best model that explains the diversification is um, a model of decreasing speciation rates uh, and a density dependent uh, decreasing speciation rate. Uh, meaning that um, the more uh, species you have, uh, the smaller the speciation rate. And this is a model consistent with the uh, adaptive radiation. So in both cases, uh, we have a, a phylogenetic signature of adaptive radiation. We don't know what has caused the adaptive radiation, but um, the patterns are consistent with an adaptive radiation. Uh, finally, um, Pleistocene refugia. Uh, actually, Pleistocene is here. And you see that most of the speciation events happened well before Pleistocene. So in this case, um, the places in climatic oscillation have not contributed to uh, species diversity. Actually, we think they might have contributed to subspecies diversity, but we are not studying this here. And we also looked at mimicry patterns. So again, we reconstructed evolution of mimicry patterns using um, maximum likelihood. We found that the ancestral had a transparent pattern. So in euphemians, you can have transparent wings or more colored wings. The ancestor was transparent. Uh, here, there was a big shift between transparent and uh, colored. And again, uh, we found that uh, shifts in wing patterns are associated with speciation um, in both genera. genera. Um, so this is quite logical, because um, in mimetic butterflies, we know there is assortative mating um, between, uh, I mean, uh, for color patterns. So you might have different races with different color patterns, but uh, males and females of one race always prefer mates from the same race. <coughs> also, if you have hybrids between different races, usually they have an intermediate phenotype, and they're not recognized by the birds, so birds always attacks, uh, attack these hybrids. So um, it's normal that if you have a shift in color pattern in a population, then um, sooner or later, uh, this new color pattern will form a new species. So to conclude on the first part, um, the, we found evidence that the Andes acted as a, bar as a barrier between uh, cis lineages, but it only accounts for less than 50% of the speciation events, so it's not the whole story. Um, so I didn't talk about marine incursions um, and rivers, uh, but um, we have no evidence that they contributed to speciation. We, we, I didn't talk about it, but marine uh, incursions uh, did limit the propagation, the um, the expansion uh, of uh, butterflies uh, toward the Atlantic forest, but they didn't uh, <coughs> didn't uh, form a speciation. Uh, and places in refugia didn't play a major role uh, in Euphemian species level diversification. Um, we also found evidence that the Andes provide, provided an altitudinal and ecological gradient, and there was uh, diversification along this gradient. But we also found um, that there was diversification within elevation level without any obvious geographical barrier. And we found a phylogenetic signature of adaptive radiation. So wh what other factors could have driven diversification? Well, we found that mimicry probably has played a role because we found um, association between shifts in mimicry patterns and speciation. And very likely, to uh, host plant shifts might have play, played a role so we don't have enough information on host plant at the species level to, to make a proper study. But at least uh, at the genus level, uh, some clades of Euphemia and specialize on different clades of Solanacea. 
And uh, it has already been hypothesized that uh, there has been adaptive radiation host on host plants. So this is something we'd like to study further. So that's it for the first part. And perhaps the main thing to, to um, rem remember from, from this is that uh, uh, adapta adaptation to elevation and mimicry probably has played a great role in, in diversification of ichthyomia and butterflies. Now, what about community structure and species coexistence? So here are representation of Ithamian communities, and uh, several factors could shape the structure of these communities. Okay. Yeah. So um, one thing could be habitat filtering by elevation, because so these species are distributed uh, along elevation gradients. Um, of course, competition could also play a role. I mean, they, they compete for resources. And uh, here we used uh, the, the framework of CAMWeb, the phylogenetic community ecology, to dis distinguish be between the two. And because uh, usually adaptation to elevation is quite strong, we suspected uh, there should be habitat filtering by elevation and no signal of competition. So we expected uh, a phylogenetic structure like this. So our first question was, um, whether we could detect uh, habitat filtering by elevation. But because these species also interact positively, um, we wanted to know um, the role of mimicry uh, on the, the community structure. And our second question was whether um, uh, co-mimic species, so species that, that share the same pattern, uh, co-occurred, coexisted more than expected by chance. This is what we expected, because they, they benefit from the, preser the presence of each other. And then we were also interested between the interactions between mimicry and elevation. Is there any connection or, or not? So um, we did this study in Ecuador, and we got um, data from eight communities at different elevations, so from 200 to 2,200 meters. We also got abundance data, um, which enables us to, to go a bit further in the result interpretation. And in total, we found uh, 161 species uh, distributed among 24 mimicry complexes. So we generated the phylogeny of all these species, um, a molecular phylogeny calibrated with time. And then we need to quantify uh, the, the extent of community structuring. Um, and for this, we use uh, indices that partition uh, diversity, species diversity, and phylogenetic diversity among community. So. Uh, the index IST refers only to species diversity regardless of the phylogeny, whereas PST uh, refers to a phylogenetic diversity. Uh, and both, both indices take abundances into account. So uh, when you have a random distribution um, with respect to the phylogeny, uh, PST should be equal to IST. Um, by the way, uh, when, when IST is bigger than zero, it means that uh, the the communities are, have a different um, species composition. So when you have a random distribution with a phylogeny, PST is equal to IST. When you have habitat filtering and phylogenetic clustering, PST is bigger than IST. And when you have competition uh, with phylogenetic overdispersion, PST is smaller than IST. So we wanted to, to measure uh, these indices in our data set to see whether we found it this, this, or this. And here, we've got a PST bigger than IST, which is significant. So um, we've got evidence for a phylogenetic clustering and some kind of habitat filtering. But is it elevation? So these indices are now calculated at the global level among our eight communities. But we can also calculate, it, uh, calculate them for pairs of communities. And we did that and um, regress them against uh, elevation distances between pairs of communities. So here you've got uh, the pair was PST indices and spatial distances in kilometers. And actually, not kilometers, but it doesn't matter. And um, because these are log scales. And here are the same indices, but uh, elevation distances. What you can see here is that uh, you can have um, communities that are very far away, but uh, they are very similar in their phylogenetic composition whereas you have uh, very close communities that are very different. So there is no pattern here with spatial distances. But when you look at elevation distances, 
species that are at the same elevation, so that have a small elevation distances, uh, also have a small phylogenetic differences. And communities that are at different elevations, so with a big uh, elevation distance, uh, also have uh, big phylogenetic distances. So this is evidence of habitat filtering by elevation. You could also see on the phylogeny, um, here is represented the, the elevation of all species, that uh, species that are related tend to occur at similar elevation, which is expected um, given that. The second question was whether uh, comic species uh, coexist more frequently than expected by chance. And so to, to test this, we use uh, this index, uh, which was designed for a species differentiation. But instead of, of species, um, we, we used a mimicry complex. So we pulled all species um, of each mimicry complex. Um, and we did a special randomization procedure to, to test uh, the value of this index. And here we found a positive value, uh, which is significant, which means that uh, comic species uh, tend to co-occur more often uh, than expected by chance. So again, it goes towards uh, our expectation. And now what the link with between this uh, mimicry structure and elevation? Again, if we, we can calculate um, pairwise, um, I mean, uh, this index uh, between pairs of community and regressive against either spatial or elevation distances, Again, there is no relationship with spatial distances, but uh, communities at the same elevation uh, have very similar mimicry composition. Communities at different elevation have very different mimicry composition. So there is a strong association between mimicry and elevation. And in fact, um, s some patterns, I mean, you, you don't find the same patterns at low and high elevation. So uh, among the 24, 24 patterns, um, only one is actually found at 200 and 2,000 meters, but all the other ones are found either at low elevation or high elevation. So to summarize, uh, we have a strong association between mimicry and elevation structures. Um, and now we, we're trying to understand why, uh, why we have this association. And in fact, uh, if you remember uh, the tree I was showing you a few minutes ago, uh, we found that um, related species tend to occur at the same elevation. So this is something we call uh, a phylogenetic signal in elevation structure. And uh, we can um, test and quantify this, uh, for instance, by uh, doing a mantle test, so a correlation between phylogenetic and elevation distances. The value isn't very big, but it's significant. So uh, there is um, species that, that are related tend to share the same elevation, even though there are many exceptions. And we find the same thing in mimicry structure. If we do a correlation between Phylogenetic and mimicry distances, um, mimicry distances zero or one, uh, depending on whether species are comimic or not. Then we find again a positive correlation, and which is significant. So, in fact, uh, two species that are closely related could have inherited both their color pattern and uh, their elevation niche uh, from their ancestor. So, this alone could perhaps explain the association we find between mimicry and elevation structures. So the question we ask is whether uh, phylogeny explains all of this association or whether instead uh, the association is stronger than expected uh, from the phylogeny. And why could it be stronger? It could be stronger because uh, there could, could be convergence of mimicry patterns among co-occurring species. So if you have two species that co-occur at the same elevation, then there, was, there will be a selective pressure for these two species to have the same mimicry pattern. And then, uh, once these two species already have the same pattern, if they overlap in part of their range, but not all the range, then it will be easier for them to spread um, in the range of the other species. So there will be additional convergence in elevation range among comimics. So this would, would tighten the association between mimicry and elevation. And to test whether uh, the association we have is stronger than expected, then we need to, to know what is expected given the phylogeny. First, we need to have a, a measure of this association. And for this, we used um, the average dis uh, elevation distance between pairs of comimic species. Then, uh, to have uh, a null distribution of uh, this, uh, this value of association, we simulated, we used the phylogeny, and we simulated uh, the elevation, uh, the elevation range of each species. We did this 10,000 times. 
and we obtained uh, a distribution of the, the value of association. So this is a distribution. And finally, we compared uh, the observed value to the distribution, and we found that it's much, much s smaller than all values, uh, and it's, of course, very significant, meaning that uh, species that share the same mimicry pattern tend to have a much smaller elevation distance than what is expected uh, given the phylogeny. So the association mimicry and elevation structure is much stronger than expected. So mimicry has uh, an important role, um, own role, independent of elevation. So to conclude on this part, so we first we found a strong filtering by elevation, and it's no wonder because when you, you change elevation, uh, a lot of factors vary. Uh, so first, abiotic factors, temperature, precipitation, oxygen, UV, etc. But uh, you also need to change your host plant and sometimes it can be very difficult if you are adapted to the chemicals of your host plant. And also we found that mimetic uh, environment also changes uh, with elevation. So again, it's very, very difficult uh, for a species um, to change elevation. So th there, there is strong uh, filtering by elevation. But um, we also found that uh, positive interactions and mimicry uh, has uh, their own role. Uh, we find that uh, common species co-occur more than expected, and there is uh, a strong association between elevation and mimicry structure, stronger than expected given the phylogeny. Um, what about competition? I haven't talked about competition except in the introduction and in my questions. Actually, uh, because we used the method of CAMWeb with um, the patterns of uh, phylogenetics in the communities, we could either detect habitat filtering or competition. I mean, either clustering or over dispersion or just random distribution. And because we detected uh, habitat filtering, then we couldn't detect competition. To study competition, um, given the strong, uh, the strong role of, of elevation, we should study communities at the same elevation. And we could also uh, study more precisely uh, what happens on the host plants, for instance. So this is something we want to do in the future. Also, um, interestingly, our results here at a rather big uh, regional scale reflects what we've already found within communities. So very briefly, um, we can consider communities uh, of a as a mosaic of microhabitats. For instance, the canopy here and um, the understory. And we found that uh, we don't have the same mimicry uh, complexes in, in the different microhabitats. For instance, the tiger butterfly tend to fly higher than the little yellow ones. We found that um, this segregation also corresponds to a segregation of potential predators. We don't have the same species uh, in the canopy and in the end story. And using uh, the phylogeny, we found uh, that uh, this structure is adaptive. So again, the association between microhabitat and mimicry is stronger than expected given the, the phylogeny. Also, at this scale, um, we had tools uh, to study competition and we found that uh, competition could only be detected among species that don't have the same pattern. And species that have the same pattern, um, they, um, they prefer, I mean, of course they don't prefer, but uh, they, they don't mind in a way uh, coexisting and perhaps uh, having to compete for resources, but th there is more benefit for them to, to coexist in the same microhabitat, um, even though they have to pay a certain cost uh, because they have to, to share the resources. And finally, so this uh, led us to think that communities perhaps are not mere um, collection of species, independent species, but they're, they're, they could be tight adaptive assemblages of species. And recent work on climate change has shown that uh, in tropical mountains, uh, climate change could lead to what they call community disassembly. So you've got uh, several species uh, that have different um, range and uh, ecological requirements and different dispersal abilities then uh, if uh, increasing temperature occurs, they will move, but not at the same speed and not as far. And um, species that previously interacted uh, might lose the interactions because they, they won't be at the same place anymore. And this could be particularly dramatic for species that interact positively, such as uh, mimetic butterflies. So um, this could lead to, to loss of species. Uh, and again, mimetic butterflies are quite... Um, textbook example of uh, positive interactions, but uh, there are many other organisms that interact positively, so the consequences of climate changes could, could go well beyond uh, what we normally think. 
So these are all the people uh, who contributed to the works uh, I presented. Uh, this is um, my people from my group and, and colleagues in France. Uh, collaborators from Campinas, but also from Colombia, from Ecuador, from the States, and from the UK. And uh, I also like to thank all the institutions um, and people that uh, enables us to to work uh, in Ecuador. Um, and that paid for the, um, the sequencing. Um, and thanks you all very much for your attention. You, you can ask me a question in Portuguese, of course. Quem quiser fazer perguntas? Eu acredito que o sucesso desse grupo esteja muito relacionado com o fato de sequestrar, desse grupo sequestrar alcaloides de plantas. Você tentou ver se tem alguma relação? É, você pensa? Porque eu, eu não sei, você falou que eles se alimentam de solanace, né? A, a constituição dessas plantas altitudinal é a mesma coisa, a, as comunidades. E... O que você falar sobre isso? É, na verdade, bom, eu não falei disso, né? mas... É... No, nos itominos são os adultos que sequestram os alcaloides de, de outras plantas, não são de solanáceas. Foi o, o Keith Brown de Campinas que fez esse trabalho. Aparentemente, pode ser que as larvas também sequestram é, alcaloides, mas depois estes são perdidos na, nas pulpas. E então, um, sim, claro que tem uma, uma segregação também das plantas com as atitudes, mas as plantas é, fonte de alcaloides, é, que são as teráceas, eu não, não sei bem como se estrutura. As solanáceas, eu sei que são bem diferentes. Mas é possível que a, a nível de larvas, as larvas tenham uma proteção uh, devido a, aos acalotes da solanácea. E isso também pode desempenhar o um papel na diversificação. Obrigado. Eu queria saber mais sobre os modelos que se apresentou lá de cladograma relacionado à comunidade. Uma pergunta de curiosidade, aquele padrão que é over disperse, que foi atribuído à competição, não podia também ser atribuído simplesmente à vicariância? Não ia produzir uma... Simplesmente eventos vicariantes não iriam produzir uma topologia semelhante entre a árvore? Eu acho que, pelo contrário, a vicarência ia produzir é, mais é, clustering, que é over dispersion, porque se você tem du duas comunidades separadas por uma, uma barreira, é, a diversificação vai, vai, vai se fazer de forma independente de cada lado, e então você vai ter um clada aqui e outro aqui. Então vai, vai ter mais uma, um padrão de clustering. Mas sua pergunta é muito interessante, porque na verdade o padrão de é, over dispersion é, pode ser explicado também por uma, por exemplo, por radiação adaptativa. E o Web que fez todo esse esse trabalho, é, ele, ele também estava consciente disso. Então, no, no papel original, tem também é, disse atenção, atenção, porque é, você tem que testar o conservatismo filogenético dos caracteres que está estudando. Mas nas explicações que o pessoal faz em geral, eles não não se preocupam do disso. Então eu acho que quando você tem um resultado de um clustering forte, sim, isso pode indicar é, uma filtragem do habitat ou talvez vicariança. Sim, seria mais agrupado. Sim. Sim, sim, entendo. Sim, 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 sim. Sim, então, logo depois da barreira você vai ter isso, mas depois, com muito mais tempo, você vai ter a agregação. Então, por isso é muito complicado. E isso também 
com os mesmos organismos, de, dependendo da, da escala geográfica, de tempo que você está olhando, você pode ter coisas totalmente opostas. Então, tudo é sempre relativo. Uh, também, quando, quando você interpreta o resultado, você sempre tem que ter em conta o, o tempo e a geografia. É, a, a, a minha pergunta primeiro é se tu, tu encontraste uh, sinal de adaptação a, a, a radiação adaptativa encontraste sinal e se não poderia explicar em vez de radiação adaptativa por uma alta taxa de extinção ou seja, tu ter na verdade extinção nos teus clados e não uma adaptação uh, radiação adaptativa é, sim, também eu não entrei nos detalhes, mas na verdade, quando eu testei a radiação adaptativa, testei vários modelos: o modelo de pura especiação sem variação, o modelo de pura especiação com pura extinção sem variação, e modelos com variação de extinção, de variação, etc. E quando eu estimava a taxa de extinção, sempre estava zero. E o modelo que está é, explicando melhor os dados. É um modelo eh, de radiação adaptativa. Então, então sim, eu comparei de vários modelos, incluindo modelos de... Com, tomando em conta a extinção. Eh, na verdade, quando, quando você tem extinção, eh, você não tem... A, a curva que, que eu mostrei são assim. Eh, primeiro, um, uma aceleração forte, de, depois uma deceleração. Quando você tem extinção, na verdade, você tem um, uma aceleração no finalzinho, porque... Espécies que vão é, ficar extintas ainda não estão extintas. Se chama o pool of the present. Então, já, já dava para ver no, no diagrama que, que a extinção não, não era muito forte. Na hora que, que faz esse teste, está é, testando é o, qual das distribuições estatísticas que mais se adapta a o padrão que tu encontra na tua filogenia. Isso tu faz usando o quê? Que, é um, que programa? É um programa no ER que se chama Laser, la, laser é, do Dan Raboski, eu posso te passar depois a referência. Mas agora tem outros programas é, mais recentes, que, com métodos um pouco mais complicados, mas é sempre o mesmo, a, a mesma fundação, é, com, calcular a likelihood de vários modelos e depois comparar essa, esses valores de likelihood para se tornar o, o, o modelo que explica melhor os dados. Sim. Ou seja, os dados são os mesmos, mas você, você tem um modelo, por exemplo, imaginamos que essa distribuição foi feita somente com especiação, sem extinção, sem nada, então estimamos a taxa de especiação e estimamos a probabilidade de ter o que temos com somente uma taxa de especiação constante. Depois fazemos a mesma coisa com taxa de especiação constante e extinção, com variáveis, etc. E depois comparamos a probabilidade de observar os nossos dados em cada modelo. E selecionamos o um modelo é, que dá a probabilidade mais alta de explicar o, os dados. Sempre é uma questão, não é, não é de adivinhar, mas sempre a gente não tem uma máquina de tempo para saber o que realmente aconteceu. Então, o melhor que a gente pode fazer é ver o, o, que é o que é o mais provável com os dados que a gente tem. Talvez a gente está totalmente errado. Eu queria voltar um pouco ao título da sua palestra, que você está buscando, então, padrões gerais que possam explicar a diversidade num ambiente extremamente rico. né? Mas você não acha que o caso dos complexos bimésticos é muito específico de tomiíneos, então não seria um padrão geral para explicar a diversidade, mas é um padrão específico para explicar a diversidade deste grupo. Sim, sim, você tem to toda a razão. Em realidade, cada grupo é específico. Então, para para entender, para tentar entender padrões gerais, é, a gente teria que trabalhar em muitos grupos diferentes. E é isso que a, cada, cada um de nós está fazendo, com é, colocando a, a sua pedrinha no edifício. É, mas é, eu acho que o importante é o, esses, esses bichos miméticos é, então tem essas interações positivas e interação positiva são totalmente ignoradas é, em outros grupos mas existem, existem bastante 
tem, tem plantas muitas, tem em, em aves, em, em peixes, tem, tem muitos exemplos. E por isso, pelo menos, bom, é um exemplo bem caricatural, mas pelo menos é, ele, ele mostra que, que não, não, não devemos ignorar essas interações. Obrigada, Mariane. Obrigada, professor Marcelo. Até a próxima, gente. Até junho.